Hi everyone, Shane from Supercon back, and I am so honored to be joined by writer, editor, letter, um, Jill of all trades, Eric Schultz. Thank you so much for joining us from the East Coast today. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is going to be my first Supercon, so I'm, I'm really excited. Yeah, this is uh, this is different than what we had planned, but the whole world is different than what we had planned. You know, uh, we wanted to have our fifth year as a physical convention, but we put that on pause and we've moved online. When I reached out to some of my uh, creator friends uh, for suggestions for the convention this year, um, immediately your name came up. Eric Burnham was like, "No, you have to invite Erica." So that's been pretty awesome. He's a good friend of the convention, and I'm glad that he uh, introduced me to your work because I've just devoured some of your stuff since I've learned your name. Um, so if I can start, what brought you, this amazingly talented writer, to this genre, this uh, comic books and, and such? Um, well, I always really enjoyed reading comics. I always enjoyed um, narrative storytelling. And uh, when I first got out of school, I, uh, I was an art director in an ad agency. So I was telling stories. I was just telling stories to sell products. Um, and after I, uh, unfortunately, I got laid off as things happen. And uh, I was freelancing for a bit and uh, I had a car accident, sadly. And when I was recuperating from the car accident, I was writing just, you know, stories, short stories and everything um, as just sort of a catharsis. And um, I got a job working at an art studio in New York uh, doing uh, as a Photoshop art artist and, you know, digital artist and such. And um, they were working on the Astonishing X-Men motion comic. So I was the lip sync animator for the, X, uh, the Astonishing X-Men motion comic Gifted for those six issues. And, um, and you know, originally it was just going to be freelance, but then they kept me on. And we started working on other comics, uh, Batman Odyssey, um, uh, the first X-Men. And I was doing, you know, backgrounds and, you know, ink assist, color assist, you know, pretty much all, all the little bit jobs I was working sure. on. Sure. Um, and I thought, I was like, you know what, I, I really think that some of the stories that I've been writing might be viable for the comics medium. So I, uh, I started doing a little more research and uh, I decided, okay, well, I'm going to take this story that I had just written when I was uh, recuperating from the car accident and I'm going to see if I can uh, make it into a comic. Um, and one of the other artists who is at the studio, a man named Vicente Alcazar, who is yeah. um, mostly known for Jonah Hex, Moon Knight, Conan, uh, I had reached out to him and I said, you know, I, I, I love your work. I love your style. Um, I have this comic. I don't know if it's anything that would interest you. Uh, so he took the script and he said, okay, you know, I'll give it a read. And he came back a few days later and he said, I, I love this. Let's do this. Um, and that was M3. So we had, uh, we put out the first issue of M3 and we shopped it around to publishers and nobody was going to take it. So we decided <laughs> to publish it ourselves. And we did two story arcs. We did uh, uh, 12 issues of M3. Yeah. It's so the self publishing, you know, you were almost kind of, you know, right time, right place for that, because that's become such a, a huge part of, of comics, again, is, is look, I'm going to create something, and, and we're going to put it out there, and whether that be through Kickstarter or, or funding of, out of your own pocket, or whatever, it's been such a boom and, and, and allowed others that may not have a story to tell to get out there, and, and I find that Shane, you paused. I lost you, Shane. You're, you're like stuck. I'll take a screen cap. There you oh, are. Hi. Hi, did you lose me for a moment? I'm sorry. I did. I, I, did. I took a screen cap. You were like this. Uh, nice, nice. I said, <laughs> <laughs> this is the joy of an online con. This is awesome. Great. Um, so I apologize if that happens again. Uh, they have chosen to uh, tear up both sides of uh, 
my streets around my property. So every once in a while they um, go, oh, look, it's an internet wire. And I should, yeah, so. The well, internet, I people, let's shake it and see what yeah, happens. Yeah, just, right, right. So I, I, what I was saying was you, you came in right at the boom of self-publishing and, and uh, we've even seen that hit here in Sioux Falls. You know, it's a, a town of only 180,000 people. And I know of three different independent comic book creators who are doing this on their own and, and it's exciting. What were some of the challenges you faced when you started M3 of getting that out there? Um, well, the biggest challenge was the learning curve of uh, publishing. I mean, I had worked in advertising and commercial art and animation and comics, um, but I didn't really know much about the publishing because the comics that I had back, that I had been working in um, were for major publishers. So it was more or less at the studio, we would do the pages, ship it out, and the publishers yeah. would be doing all the production work and everything. Um, so I kind of, I, I had to sort of fast and, you know, fast and dirty learn it. And, um, and I, I ended up really enjoying it. Uh, I, I taught myself lettering. Um, I worked on um, lettering other people's work to, to, to try and get, uh, to try and get experience. Um, and I think at the time though, conventions were really important to getting the book out there, right. uh, to getting your name out there. Um, and unfortunately, the time that we're living in now, that can't really happen. But um, I was uh, pretty active on social media. I still am. And uh, I think that that's incredibly important. Um, if you ha it's interesting because if you do a Kickstarter or some type of crowdfunded campaign, that in and of itself starts to sort of bring people in and bring, you know, sort of hype up, which is great. Um, so I, I would almost suggest to people to look into doing a, um, a crowdfunding campaign because that actually helps build your audience a lot quicker, especially in the situation now where there are no conventions to try and build your audience. Right. Yeah. So it's look. I'm investing in this. I think there's a little bit of even ownership um, as a Kickstarter backer. It's like, oh, this looks really exciting, and I'm going to get this. And then you know the extras that are thrown in oftentimes yeah. in Kickstarter. Um, but I do believe there's a little bit of I was part of this. You know, whereas as opposed to you go and you pick up a book from Marvel, DC, whoever it may be, and there's no connection with the Kickstarter. It's like, I helped this person get this. It's funny that you say that because when um, Kickstarter and Indiegogo really started um, uh, gaining steam, a friend of a friend was talking to me because I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do a crowdfunding <laughs> thing. And the way he explained it to me was, because uh, I, I tend to be kind of cynical about things, and I admit that. The way he <laughs> explained it to me was, you are offering an opportunity for people to be a part of something. And, you know, people that do Kickstarters are saying, I want to make this, and I need you to help me make this. And you're offering this very unique opportunity. Um, and when you frame it in that mindset, it, it feels better because I'm a very, very proud person. I'm the first person to admit that. So like, I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm not going to panhandle digitally to make, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But when you think about it as, you know, letting people get in on the ground floor kind of thing, yeah. um, like, like you said, invest, um, it, it really, it sort of helps break you out of that like crazy mindset. Um, and we actually did do a Kickstarter. I did a Kickstarter with Claire Connolly for a book called Strange Tales, which is actually up for a, um, a Ringo for Best Anthology. You know, why don't we just rename the Ringos, uh, the Ericas, because it seems to me that everything you touch lately is uh, nominated. And it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and you've won a number as well. Uh, Oh, well, we'll no, I haven't into... won any Ringos yet. Well, I thought, I thought, I thought that, that my, my apologies, okay. I, I, I thought that you had won, um, but the nomination is great. I mean, I mean, Mike Ringo was, I mean, what an amazing artist and what an amazing, every story I've heard about him, the lives he touched, but, you know, an honor to be nominated. And of course it is, you know, and, and um, so we'll get to that book that I've fallen in love with, by the way, but I kind of want to walk through the rest of your career. So we went M3, which I, I think is a pretty amazing, especially in the context of this is the first first attempt. I think it's fun. Um, so where do we go from there? And then you kind of got the eye of, of Marvel and of Gale and some different things there. Is that how it progressed, Erica? Yeah, um, I, uh, I did M3 and I got it in front of a few editors at Marvel and then um, 
I was given the opportunity to work on Revenge, The Secret Origin of Emily Thorne. It was the um, prequel to the first season of the ABC TV show Revenge. And I got to work with the television producers on the show. And it was very, very, it was, again, it was like there was a learning curve, but, you know, uh, but I hopefully made my way through it. Um, and then, you know, it's it's interesting when you're working in comics, it's sort of like you're it, you're constantly walking up the stairs and right. constantly trying, you know, sometimes you're taking the stairs two by two and sometimes you're taking them at a crawl. But every every job that you do is is, you know, another building block to the next job. So after I got the Marvel job, um, I was contacted by Gail Simone to work on Swords of Sorrow, which was huge. Yeah. Um, and I got to work with some incredible creators like Mickey Kendall and Leah Moore and Margaret Scott and uh, Marguerite Bennett and uh, Anike. And, you know, and that really helped me because it helped me network as well. Yes. Um, and, and, that, and that really helped a great deal. And then after that, I was asked to be part of um, the pilot program for the DC Comics uh, New Talent Showcase. Um, yes. At the time, they hadn't really known how they were going to do it, so they had uh, grouped, <clears throat> excuse me, they had grouped a couple of people together um, to be part of a pilot program and to sort of like use us as guinea pigs. Uh, <laughs> and we went through the program, and it was uh, taught by Scott Snyder and um, you know Jim Lee and Dan Dedeo were very much involved. Uh, Bobby Chase, you know, editor extraordinaire Bobby Chase, yes, was part of it. Um, and it really was, it was really interesting to see how other people uh, did their process because everyone has a very individual process when it comes to writing and creating. Um, and it was really interesting to see how everyone else did it. Uh, Vita Ayala was part of that. Emma Beebe, who I had known from Swords of Sorrow, she was part of that as well. Um, so it was, I mean, it was really, it was a terrific experience. Um, and I got to write a, uh, uh, an eight page story with Sunny Lou for Hawkgirl, which I yeah. adore. And um, and yeah, I mean, it just little by little by little started, you know, snowballing. And then I did uh, Charmed for Dynamite. I also did Xena for Dynamite. Uh, I got to do Daredevil for Marvel. Um, and then again, going back to creator owned um, 12 Devils Dancing uh, that came out through Action Lab. That's a horror comic. Um, and then swinging back around to Forgotten Home. And throughout yeah. that, I'd been working on some anthologies and such, like Where We Live, uh, which was an Eisner and Ringo nominated anthology. Yeah. That was the uh, Las Vegas one. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Beautiful, Las beautiful, Las beautiful book. book. Yes. Fantastic. I mean, um, J.H. Williams had, uh, had brought everybody together, and it really, I mean, it was amazing. The, uh, the sheer talent that was associated yeah, with that yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was really honored to be a part of it. Yeah, there's been, uh, uh, you know, being 9-11 today, I think the first real big anthology books I, I, I remember, and I'm sure there were others before, but were the 9-11 books, you know. And, and I've, uh, I've been a big supporter of them since, you know, um, Where We Live, and then um, the beautiful comic that was written after The Pulse, tragedy and, and you know so I, I love when I see people coming together and, and it's twofold right we're bringing uh, awareness to the cause we're, and then also it's a way for new writers for new artists to uh, be associated with a big project that has a larger platform um, to get your story out there and get noticed that was a heck of a class that you came out of with that DC writers that yeah. what what a group I mean um, that's responsible for a lot of, of new of new writing here I was talking to Shay Fontana yesterday and and Shay talked about the network that you're talking about and you know meeting this person and working with this person and uh, being able to create a bond and and then hey I need someone on this and I know you it makes it so much easier when you're open to meeting people have you stayed in connection with a, a lot of the writers that you worked with there? The Absolutely. Um, Chris Savella was one of the writers in the class. Uh, Vita Ayala, Emma Beebe, Joelle Jones, yeah. um, uh, Adam Smith. Um, I'm running through the, the roster in my head right now. <laughs> um, That's okay. That's okay. I mean, powerhouse. 
Yeah, I mean, really yeah. fantastic. Well, they also, and the other thing is that they also had like an artist, uh, an artist um, pilot program as well. And that's where Sonny was in it and uh, Carrie Randolph and some of the other artists. Um, so it really was, it was it was an incredible experience and um it, it did help me make connections with a lot of other creators um and especially i think it's it's sometimes you know when you're a comics writer you feel like you should you should only be trying to reach out to artists to you know connect but no you need to reach out to other writers and you need to right. bounce ideas off of people and such um and that really that program really helped sort of um uh sort of solidify that yeah it created a, a, an opportunity for feedback and for people that you yeah. feel comfortable speaking with when you write for comics do you script or do you write specifically panel for panel what is your process like when you're writing specifically for comics um i have a very macro to micro process okay i um i start writing where i have um like what is the general idea of the story? And then I write a timeline. So what are the events that lead up to the story? What are the events of the story? And then what is the aftermath of the story? And I sort of do it in a chronological order. And then I choose, um, I, I choose which order from that chronology uh, which order I'm going to present it to the reader. And then once I have that, I start sort of breaking down each issue. Okay, so these are the events that are going to occur in issue one, issue two, issue three, whatever. Um, and then I start breaking that down into sequences. So this is this scene is going to be one page, this scene is going to be two pages, this sequence is going to be, you know, one page, whatever. And then once I have that all broken down, it's sort of like a roadmap. Then I go to script. Um, I tend to front load a lot of my work. So when I script, I literally just have to say, okay, how many panels are gonna be on this page? And what are the dialogue uh, balloons? Uh, what are the, what are the, the dialogue lines? Um, because I really wanna make sure that I work everything out as, as, as deeply as possible before I start really scripting and putting it into a format and things like that. Um, and that's that's pretty much how I teach writing at the Kubert School, um, yeah. using that process. Um, and it for me, it helps. Um, what I always say is, look, this is the process that I have. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't, that's fine. But you guys still got to use it for the assignment. <laughs> but even if it doesn't work for you, it at least gives you um, it gives you a baseline. You know, sure. um, a lot of people don't know how to start writing. You know, that's always that's always the thing. Well, I have this idea in my head. How do I write it? Well, here here is a paradigm for you to work within. If it doesn't work for you, then create your own. But you at least now know some of the things and some of the ways that people write. Um, I'm very big into outlines. I know some people don't do outlines at all. And God bless them if they can write without an outline. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, there's a there's a great writer and creator named Jenny Wood who I adore, and she and I uh, would always tease each other on panels because I can't write without an outline and she can't write with one, and wow. you know, and she's done comics and novels and I'm like I don't know how you do it, but you know, God bless you for doing it because if I had to write a novel without an outline, I it would just be word salad everywhere. So how much? Freedom do you give your uh, artists for interpretation of your words? Oh, are I, you micro or you let them go? I usually, what I do is um, I always communicate with the artist ahead of time. And I always say, like, I, I, I always work with an artist who's on the same page. Um, for me, the work is paramount. So I'm not sitting there, you know, keeping score of how many ideas the artist came up with and how many ideas I came up with. I don't care about that. I care about the work being the best that it can be. And if I present something that isn't working for the artist and they come up with a better solution to that, um, to that situation, do it. Because we just want the work to be the best. And I, 
I mean, and in certain situations, you're paired up with an artist that you uh, that you may not know and that you may not have uh, worked with before. And in that situation, I always try and communicate with the artist just to make sure that we're all on the same page. But um, I always tell an artist, look, you know, the average amount of panels per page is five. So if I write a page that is five panels and you can communicate the same information in four panels or you need six panels, you do it however you're going to do it. But this is the communication that needs to be, this is what needs to be communicated as, you know, the pacing goes along in the story. As long as this gets, you know, you know, um, articulated to the reader, I don't care how many panels it is. <laughs> you know, That's um, wonderful. Because I... Comics is a collaboration, and even though I've worked in pretty much every aspect of comics, I talk about comics as uh, when I when I do my lectures uh, for the Cuber School, I talk about the cosmic comics wheel, how it's one of those big old wagon wheels. Your story is in the center, and the spokes are you know your editor, your writer, your letterer, your production artist, whatever. And I've done all the spokes, you know, and and I think that having worked on every aspect of comics makes me a better writer. Um, I would say so, yes, writer. yes, yeah. Because I know I, what, what those other people are going through. I agree completely. I was, in fact, I was going to bring that up. The fact that you, you know, you have an eye, you've been a letter, and, and I think that people forget or maybe don't even realize the work that goes into placing a balloon in just the right place, the, the type of text that's used, because look, the picture is nice, but what's happening, you know, you give a script, you have to join those two together, the words plus the action portrayed on the panel. And I think people forget that. And of course, you've done inking, you've done the editing. You said you've been every spoke of the wheel. So there is an understanding for you that, yep, this needs to be done. This is just as important as this part. Um, and, and collaborative is, I, I find that the more people you can trust and bring into any creative project, um, whether that be creating a comic book or creating a comic convention like we did, and there's going to be friction, there's going to be disagreements, but in the end, like you said, the story is paramount, right? This is what matters in our journey to get there to be, create the best progress product of it. I think it's just beautiful. I Now I want to sign up for the Kubert School and go to one of your writing classes, although I have zero talent for it, but I, I can outline. I can outline. I'm really good shape. at that. I will whip you into shape. <laughs> um, we Well, we did do online classes over the summer. I did uh, three summer sessions, uh, six-week summer sessions, um, but we haven't done it this year during the fall just because I have, you know, the regular classes in person and it would have been too much and I said, I was like, look, I'm teaching three classes in person, you know, and I'm editing two series and I'm writing a, a two series. And I'm do, I was like, I, I can't do all of it simply because I, I try to do the most and the best that I can. I try to be 110% for everything that I do, which I know the math doesn't work out. Right. <laughs> um, but I try and I, I know that if I took on just one more thing, then everything would sort of fall down right. yeah. so i'm gonna wait until maybe we'll do like another spring or summer session um when a, a few other things sort of calm down um but i am hoping to do another uh another online writing session so if we do you know there it is It'd be beautiful it's, it's a six week online session i uh i have friends that are writing right now and i would gladly turn them that way so what how did you become associated with cooper skill um, I can't talk. <laughs> I was on, I'm trying to think, I was on a, um, I was in an anthology for A Wave Blue World, which is okay. um, a, uh, a small comics publisher. And the, um, the co-owner of A Wave Blue World, T Tyler Chintaner, is actually a QB, he's a QB grad. Okay. And so Tyler and Wendy, his wife, um, were sort of setting up like a little what do you call it? Like a little sort of like um, book tour. And while I was on, on that little book tour, I met Fernando Ruiz, who is one of, not only a Kubert graduate, but also one of the instructors at the Kubert School. Um, he and I ended up uh, pairing up for a, a short story for Betty Page, which was fun uh, for the Halloween issue. 
uh, last year. But um, so I, you know, Fernando had mentioned that it would be great if I came and spoke to the school. This was about two years ago. So I said, all right, sure, you know, have whoever contact me. Um, and Lloyd uh, Briggery, who again is another alum of the Kubert School. There are a lot of alums of the Kubert School that are sure, working sure. the Kubert School. It's, it's very much a family. Um, and so, uh, whereas I'm like the redheaded stepchild because, <laughs> because I didn't go to the Kubert School because I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Lloyd brought me in and I did a couple portfolio reviews. Um, we did like a Q&A panel for the school. And, um, and after that, I mean, uh, it, it really, I thought that it went well, they thought that it went well. And a couple of months later, um, one of my former editors, Anthony Marquez had contacted me and said, Hey, by the way, I'm running the Kubert school now. And, oh. uh, and he is also a Kubert school Kubert graduate. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he said, I'm running the Kubert school now and, um, I need a writing instructor. Would you like to come in and, and teach writing? And I thought, why not? Why not? So, yeah, exactly. So I'm teaching uh, writing and imaginative drawing for the third year students. It's a three year school. Yep. And then I'm teaching um, a story adaptation for the second year students. So I've got two classes a day for three days. Uh, and uh, yeah, the third year students now had me last year. So they're already used to me. Whereas the second year students, I got to break them in. <laughs> I'm sure you're quite the taskmaster. <laughs> That's the thing is, like I say, you know, if, if you can survive me, then you can survive a monthly comic deadline. Spoken like a true editor. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to talk about this amazing uh, book that you're writing um, called uh, Forgotten Home. I have a soft spot for the through the looking glass, through the closet door, through the wardrobe type story. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm, I'm. I am, I'm 52 and those stories, you know, still resonate today. My, my 12 year old son loves those types of stories. Um, but there's something about that, that flip between worlds that, that just, man, it touches me and, and, and magic and fantasy and, and all of that. Erica, this is a beautiful story. This mm -hmm. is a very smartly written book um, that I, I'm like, seriously, I got a little hair stand up here. It's, it's just Any it's sense. so Right, right. It's it's so well done, and and when you can connect as a reader with that, um, I always feel, and maybe I'm wrong, but I always feel that when I connect so deeply with with a piece of work, that the creator, this is a very personal story. Can you talk about the process that went into creating this amazing story and and, and where it came from? Um, well, it's funny that you you talk about that. Um, so Forgotten Home, when when the when the movie Frozen came out and everybody was gushing about Frozen, <laughs> I I kind of wanted to make the anti-Frozen. I wanted to make a story about two sisters who hated each other and wanted to kill each other. Uh, so so I uh, I started writing a story and um, and as it, as I was putting things together, it was sort of going in two different directions. And so I said, all right, these little bits here are viable on their own, but they're not really fitting in with the rest. So let me push those over there and then finish going where I'm going. Um, and when I had time to go back to those little bits, I noticed that those were sort of the seeds for where Forgotten Home came from. And um, it, it is a personal story. It's a story about family. I tend to write a lot about family. Um, I think family is very important, whether it's by blood or by, by bond. Yes. Um, and you know, there are very close relationships that I've had with people over 30 plus years um, that are like, are like family to me. And I know that over, you know, when you've been friends with someone for so long, there's always moments where you're going to hurt somebody. And obviously it's never intentional, right. but there are consequences to that. And so I wanted to write a story about a woman who ran away from all of her problems and thought, okay, um, I'm going to literally a new world. Yeah. And um, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm making my, I'm making my own destiny. 
I'm, I'm running away from the destiny and the fate that has been um, told to me. And I make predetermined. Own, yeah, exactly. And yeah. I make my own destiny and I'm going to do my own thing. And then when it comes to the fact that she has to go back to that world, she's not only faced with the destiny that she ran away from, but the devastation of the people that she hurt when she left. You know, there were a lot of people that she hurt. Yeah. She left broken hearts in her wake. And, you know, it's this idea of you can run away from all the problems that you want, but sooner or later it is going to catch up to you. Um, a friend of mine uh, who was in the service used to always say, uh, crow tastes like crap, but it tastes better warm. Um, That's it, a great one. <laughs> you know, um, so it's this idea of, you know, making up for, you're going to eat crow for your mistakes, do it as soon as you can, because resentment grows over time. And that's what we see when Lorraine goes back to Janata. She thinks that she can just sort of come in, do what she needs to do and come out. And it's like, no, 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 no. No. It's not going to be that simple, darling. <laughs> so how, yeah. how much of you is in Lorraine? I would say that there is a, a good bit of me in every character that I write. Um, okay. So I, I am part evil queen, Rani. Um, <laughs> I, I am part, you know, headstrong uh, Lorraine. I am also part immature Joanna. Um, I am part, part on my sleeve Trader, um, who, uh, when I was talking to another, to a podcaster, they said, uh, I just want to hug Trader. He's just, <laughs> he's, he just has like such a bad rap in this whole, in this whole thing, you know? You know, it, you know, with the advent of, of you know, Netflix and, and, and Hulu and the other streaming platforms, this reads like a, a children's series. I don't want to say children, but a young adult uh, animated series. Has there been any interest in that or do you have interest in pursuing bringing this? I certainly have interest in pursuing it. I am not at liberty to say if there has yes. been okay. interest okay. in it, but I yes. certainly have interest in pursuing it. Uh, Every, every story that I write, I want to write as a good story, as a good comic. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't lie and say that because I come from a background of like advertising, television, and things like that, I can't say that when I'm writing it, I don't already have a vision for it. Um, 12 Devils Dancing, which was a horror series that I did through Action Lab Danger Zone in 2018, 2019, um, when I was writing that story, I originally wrote it as a television series. Okay. Um, and then I went back and made it into a comic. Now, it was a six-issue comic, but I had 22 episodes worth of uh, material. So... Um, Macro to micro. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I would love to see, I mean, there had been, over the years, the, the, uh, M3 had been optioned a few times over the years. Okay. Uh, but nothing came out of it. So, I mean, I would love to see M3, 12 Devils, uh, Forgotten Home uh, put on a streaming uh, platform or something like that. I would absolutely love that. So if you know somebody, call me. Um, <laughs> but, but I just want to make good comics. Yeah. Um, and when you said that this is a good comic and it resonated with you, that, that makes me feel good to know that it's connected. Um, I think the most important thing that you need to do as a creator is you need to create a connection with your audience because once that connection is there, then they're going to be rooting for the good guy and booing the bad guy. And that's exactly what you want them to do. Yeah. I, I need to be invested as, as a right, as a reader, as a fan, there has to be something human in those flaws. Yeah. And Erica, you write great flaws. You know, um, uh, you do, and and but that's what makes you buy the character. That's what makes you buy them. But if if the ring was this, oh goodness and light and everything. No, I mean, who? That's that's Disney, and it's wonderful, and it has its audience. It's not me, and not most of the readers I know. We want to see flawed. We want to see a redemptive story. We want to we want to see the ugly in between the cracks. And, and Lorraine falls on her face many a time. And, yeah, yeah. and there's, and I think just in general, 
um, you know, we all have a bit of hubris. In yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because you see Lorraine on yeah. Earth and she's got, you know, she's kind of cocky because she has these abilities. She has these magical powers that no other Earthlings have. But when she goes back home, she's not special at home. Because, no. not, yeah, she might have these magical powers, but so do a lot of other people. Right, also, right. she's out of practice. She's untrained. You know, had she stayed instead of running away, she would have been way more well-trained, but she's untrained. She just thinks that she can just sort of, you know, wave her hand and everything gets done. And that's actually something that, you know, when her mom basically beats her yeah. like that, she says, you know, you might be extraordinary over there, but here, no, yeah. you're, you're nothing special. Right, right. You know, and that's something that Lorraine, you know, had lived on Earth for so long and was like super magical, cool person on Earth. But guess what? That's not the case here. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the humbling experience, right? It's, and it's, I think every great uh, heroic arc needs that humbling experience. We need to see the character grow. Um, so yeah, I would as soon as I win the lottery, we'll go ahead and get that produced and, and animated and, and out there for you. I, I would I love start, that. I need to start playing the lottery first. Uh, so exactly. you've had you've had some experience working, you know, you uh, with um, established characters. You've created your own. Um, it looks like, and, and uh, I hope I'm not telling tales out of school here. It looks like your next one you're going to go back to a, an older character, an established character. And uh, right. a pulp hero, and it looks like a lot of fun. Um, what can you tell us about that? Uh, Legacy of Mandrake is, uh, it's being distributed by Red 5 and Stonebot Comics, and uh, King Features Syndicate yeah. is involved. And um, it is a, it is not a reboot of the original Mandrake the Magician, because we're not taking the original Mandrake and creating a new character. This, the original Mandrake still exists in this universe. Um, uh, Legacy of Mandrake is a young woman who has a connection to the original Mandrake. Um, her mother and the original Mandrake were very close friends. And so uh, Mandragora Costanza Tarada Paz is her name. <laughs> she goes by Mandy Paz. And, um, and Mandy is a young woman who has magical abilities like Mandrake. Uh, but she is untrained. She's a teenager, so she's a bit impetuous. Um, and her best friend, LJ, is actually the son of Lothar, who was Mandrake, yep. original Mandrake's partner. Yep. So, um, so we have Mandy, you know, sort of fumbling her way through things. Um, and in the small town that she lives in, in um, Mountain Vista, New York, uh, there's a mystery, and she uses her abilities um, and and brings LJ along for the ride to try and solve this mystery uh, in her town. Um, and she grows as a magician. She grows as a person. Um, her relationship is kind of contentious with her mom um, because her mother has some abilities, but not she's not as powerful as Mandy. And that sometimes gets Mandy, Mandy you know, sort of, has this acrimonious, well, you don't understand me because you're just a mis you know, you're just a mystic. You're not like a magician like me, <laughs> kind of thing. So, you know, smart ass teenager stuff. Yeah, yep. Yeah. The um, impetuousness of youth. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you have a twelve year old, so it's coming. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um but but it's a lot of fun. Um Amelia Vidal did the covers and Diego Garibaldi did the um interiors and um it's a lot of fun and it's you know even if you are not familiar with the original mandrake the magician you can still come into this and think oh it's just a young woman you know learning about magic learning about uh, her own abilities and how she fits in to this you know crazy world so yeah so king features i mean you know for uh, a generation ahead of me at uh, king features was you know, were the heroes, and, and Mandrake was was center of that. Um, you know, and there's been multiple attempts to recapture the magic of of King Features. I'm so excited that you're just playing in the world, right? Not that 
I imagine your vision of Mandrake would be amazing in any other character. But I love that it's in the world of the King features that that we're, we're uh, uh, respecting the legacy, but we're going this other and we're going this other way. Not even but we're going this other way and we're going this other way. Um, I find it interesting. We have a conflict between a mother and daughter again in this story. <laughs> it's funny because I started writing Forgotten Home before I got the Mandrake job and before uh, Forgotten Home had come out. So Forgotten Home, so I got the Mandrake job before Forgotten Home came out and I had already written multiple issues of it and Marika Cresta, who is uh, the line artist who did a phenomenal job, um, Marika had um, had started already working on it and I was like oh, do they, I, I don't know if I should tell them that I'm already doing something with like a teenage girl and a mom and everything mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing is that you know the original Mandrake magi the magician um, you know for people who aren't familiar with um, with the series uh, Mandrake didn't have um, a secret identity. He traveled all around the world solving crimes, solving, yes. you know, not just supernatural crimes, but even everyday crimes. Um, and our Mandy, because she's a teenager, she has a, um, she has a secret identity. Uh, we, she hasn't been going all over the world. You know, she's just solving crimes in her, you know, small little right. town. Like we kind of think like Buffy slash Nancy Drew kind of thing. Sure, uh, sure. But we're hoping to do an, a new arc. And now that Mandy has sort of reached that first hurdle and really started testing who she is, um, we're hoping to have her, you know, have a more worldwide adventure. Sure. Yeah. The, the, the heroine's journey, right? So don't, don't sit too high on your horse here, Mandy, because here's the next thing. It was kind of, uh, 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 Hercules and you know facing all the different tasks it's it's I'm excited I have not started but I'm, I'm excited to read this uh, so there's been a recurring theme recently that I've seen and and we're lucky enough to have a, a number of guests during Supercon line um, Shay yourself uh, Cami Garcia Judd Whittick there's an audience this young adult audience that I sometimes feel like other publishers have forgotten about. They're writing to the established audience, people like me, they're always going to buy comics. I'm so excited that there are stories geared towards young readers, young adult readers that excite them, speak their language, speaks their word. You know, we can look back, uh, you know, when Bendis rebooted uh, Peter Parker, right? That was the first, I went, wow, this is smart, right? And then he's gone with, on with Miles, but do you intentionally write for a certain audience? Did you go in, in, into this going, this would work for younger readers? This is someone they can relate to? Or does just the story happen and whoever happens to read it? Well, it kind of depends. <clears throat> so with Mandrake, we had an established idea that this was going to be, this was going to be our demographic. You know, anybody mm -hmm. could read this story, but this is the, this is the group that we're really going to try and focus on. With Forgotten Home, I just thought about, okay, I'm going to write a story about moms and about loss and about redemption and things like that. Um, and if it falls in that sort of YA genre, then great. Um, because I know that that is, you know, that's pretty much where people really want content right now. Yes, um, yes. I would, I mean, I would hazard a guess to say, yes, Mandrake is absolutely YA. I would say Forgotten Home is sort of like on the line of YA. You know? Yeah, Forgotten Home. Forgotten Home is one that I want to share. Right, that's mine. I can see where where Mandra could be one that Derek is like, Dad, read this. You know, yeah. my twelve year old. That's how I came into Hilo from Judd Winnick. He was reading like, Dad, you'll love this. It's how I came into Amulet by Kazu. It's you'll love this. And see, so that that multi generational sharing. Oh my gosh, I mean. You're, you, you know, you talked earlier about family, right? Here's something we can share. Here's something we can bond over. You know, the nerds and geeks of the world, we, we talk, we used to just talk in, in the comic book shop and, and at conventions, and now we talk online all the time. Hey, have you read this? Have you seen this? And going back to the Kickstarter, if we go full loop here, I'm backing this, you should back this too. And, and 
Yeah, so there is a, a familial bond just through the actual genre, and then to represent that in the pages as well. It's a pretty cool job you have, Erica. Not bad at all. You kind of set the table for a lot of us. I, I am I am very blessed. I mean, I I got my start reading comics, stealing them from my older brother. So, so comics will always be linked, <laughs> you know, to some type of of family uh, for me, just in general. Um, but like, yeah, like everybody had like an uncle who turned them onto comics, or you know, a dad or or sibling, um, or you know, my my mom grew up reading The Atom and loved The Atom. Like oh, that wow. was her that was her comic of choice. Um, she loved Ray Palmer. And, um, you know, so we, as, as kids, we were always uh, into like sci-fi and fantasy. Like my dad read a lot of Ray Bradbury and Asimov. And, you know, my mom um, was actually back in the day in the old, old, ye olden days of uh, <laughs> Star Trek fanzines, uh, sure. my mom would actually do st spot illos for the Star Trek fanzines. So you so, have this in your in your family. Yes. Is, yeah, so, very cool. I mean, I've been to conventions since before I can remember. There's a story that my mom tells about how she took me to a convention. Uh, I was three months old, and she took me to a convention at, uh, I want to say it was in New York. It might have been, it might have been in Maryland, because I remember going to a lot of conventions in Maryland. But she took me to a convention where Mark Leonard was there, the, the gentleman who played Sarek, um, yeah. Mark's father. And there's a photo of him holding me, little beat <laughs> Erica, um, you know, sepia tone, 1970s photo uh, oh my gosh. Of, of Mark Leonard. And, um, you know, so, and I remember going to conventions and meeting George Takei. I remember meeting, you know, a lot of these phenomenal actors and such. Um, but yeah, I mean, sci-fi and fantasy, and that's something that, you know, was always my, in my blood. Uh, we used to, you know, Saturday night, they used to have the old Flash Gordons and, you know, Doctor Who's and yeah, like that. Yeah. We used to watch that. Although I do have to say that after Peter Davison, I kind of, I didn't like Colin Baker very much. So I would say like John Pertwee, Tom Baker and Peter Davison were my Doctor Who's. And then after that, I haven't really gotten back into it, though I know it's huge now again. So maybe yeah, I'll, I'll dip a toe. Yeah, it's, so uh, yeah, it's, it happens with so much fandom. No, uh, the original Star Trek is mine. You can have Enterprise, you can have Next Gen, you can have whatever. No, Kirk and Spock, that's the real story. You know, it's just, again, but good stories span generations, yeah. right? Like, through the looking glass, through the closet door, into a different realm, spans generations. Conflict with family. I mean, from I mean, if we look at storytelling, one of the first stories shared, Cain and Abel, Romulus and Remus, you know, family conflicts. It's it's been there forever. It's it's because it's real, right? It's something that we all touch. And and when you look at these fantasy stories, we all want to escape. We all want to be able to snap our finger and step into another world. And there's times when we want that. And I think that that's at its best writing, illustration, stories. Just take the pain away for a moment. They quiet the mind. They, they let us forget that this is happening and we can just escape for a little bit. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing that you share, Erica. And I hope that, oh God, what am I saying? I hope that you remember that. I hope that you never lose the fact that there's people like us out here that need your stories. Well, that's the world gets overwhelming. Now. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I, I know. Lay, that on your, lay that on your second year student. <laughs> that's a huge responsibility. But no, but I, I thank you for saying that. I thank you for saying that stories are important. And, and I absolutely think that they are. Um, and I think that there is... And like you said, I mean, stories about conflict have been around since the beginning of time. You know, you think of Hercules and Theseus and Medea and, um, you know, Oedipus Rex. You know, there's there's so much. And, and you'd mentioned, actually, the heroine's journey earlier. You made a Joseph Campbell reference. You know, this idea of, like, all stories have sort of a path. 
Uh, that's something I actually teach. I, you know, I show them how the Wizard of Oz is exactly the same as Star Wars, is exactly the same as Batman, you know, kind of that's thing. Right. Um, but stories are important. And I think that they're important to distract. So even if it's, even if it's a sad story, it's a story that says, okay, um, maybe my life isn't so bad. And if it's a happy story, it uplifts you, you know, so it, these, they are important. And I think especially in times of crisis, uh, that escapism, like you said, is important. Yeah, absolutely. Erica, um, I have three quick fire questions. Okay? okay. And to end with number one, given your choice of any character from any genre, what character do you, would you love to write? Uh, I would love to write Indiana Jones, and I would love to write Moon Knight. Wow. Uh, oh, wow. And, and a crossover would be wonderful, by the way. I want to actually, uh, I, I mentioned this on Twitter, I would love to do a Moon Knight Hawk Girl crossover where they're solving crimes together. That would be really cool. That would be really cool. Moon Knight's so much fun, uh, uh, and, and the revitalization of that character. Wonderful. <laughs> um, number two, uh, what is your favorite all-time comic book character? That is really tough. Um, maybe Hawk Girl. Maybe. And you've maybe, had an opportunity I mean, to write her. May, no, it's and it's not just because I got a chance to write her, but maybe her because even when Gardner Fox kept uh, changing her and everything, mm -hmm. um, I I really I just and I absolutely loved her portrayal in the um, Justice League cartoon show. I thought she was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I think that was probably one of the strongest portrayals, and that's probably who everybody pretty much remembers and really sticks with. Yeah, Kendra was very, it was very strong character, very well written character in, in that animated series. And my final uh, quick fire question, uh, you doing anything next year and you wanna to come to South Dakota? Uh, I would love to come to South Dakota. <laughs> if, if you guys are running next year, I would love to come to South Dakota, I'm, I'm down. I would love to have you, absolutely. I've never been to uh, South Dakota, so I will, I will check that Check that state off my list. You know, I hear that a lot. That's one of my main selling points, uh, you know, so we would love to have you. Erica, uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you for agreeing to be a part of Super Combine. Um, I will definitely, we will have a link up so people can um, look at your work. Uh, we will push people towards your work because it is worthwhile to reading. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, tune in uh, for the next interview, everyone. And thanks for hanging out with Eric and I. Bye now.